Part two, chapter one. Jimmy was gone, but in a weird sort of way he wasn't. It was like he'd reached into my life and given me a good shaking. Like he'd taken my eyelids and pulled them wide open and let the light in. There was no going back to the old ways. Take television. That first Saturday in May when I knew Jimmy wouldn't be at the park, I turned on the tube. After 10 minutes, I was out of the house. It was stupid to sit indoors when there was a baseball diamond where a game might be going. And the kind of competitor I was, that was different too. Before Jimmy, if, in, if somebody started goofing off and ruining a game, I wouldn't have said anything. I hadn't cared enough to argue with anybody about anything. Jimmy made me care. I found that, that out in July after Babe Ruth's season ended when I had my run-in with Greg Daly. When you're in a league, the umpires make those calls and keep guys from fighting. I'd had a good, a good time in Babe Ruth, even without Jimmy, even though we didn't win many games. I hit over 300 and played second base well enough to dream again about being a major leaguer. But Babe Ruth's season ended in late June and I still wanted to play ball, so every day that summer I'd pick up my gear, head over to Henry Ford, and get a game going with whoever else showed up. That's where I ran into Daly. He was big and strong and mean, and everyone said that in a fight, he once pounded a guy's head into a wall and knocked him unconscious. It was always the same thing. After the first couple innings, Daly would start cheating. He claimed to be safe when he was really out, or he'd say he checked his swing when everybody knew he'd swung through. Pretty soon, other guys started cheating, and then we had big arguments, and the games got ugly. I didn't do anything about Daly for a couple of weeks because I kept hoping that he'd stop coming. I guess I was afraid of him too, but every day I got madder and madder. And one day in mid-July, Daly rifled a shot up the alley in right center. Our right fielder cut it off and threw a nice one hopper to me. Daly was out by 10 feet. But when I put the tag on him, he grabbed my arm, pulled the ball out of my glove, threw it on the ground. Safe, he screamed, you dropped the ball. He stood on the bag, a stupid grin on his face. He was sucking the joy right out of the game and laughing in our faces while he did it. Stop being an idiot, I said. It took a, wh a while for the words to sink in a thick skull. What did you call me? A crazy courage swelled up in me. I called you an idiot. Oh yeah? He came off the base, stuck his foot behind my leg and shoved me hard. I fell backward and landed in a heap. Have a nice trip? He leered, looming over me, fists clenched. I remember the sweat dripping down my forehead and into my eyes. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I knew I couldn't let Daly run the baseball field, not without a fight. The other guys were behind me. I felt it. They liked baseball. Maybe not as much as I did. Maybe not enough to take on Daly, but they wanted to play ball. They were counting on me, on me to make Daly play right or quit. I scrambled to my feet, picked up the ball, and tagged Daly on the arm. You're out, Daly, I said. You're off the bag. You were out before for interference, but now you're out again. My team is up. I strode by him toward home plate. I'm not out, Daly roared, and your team is not up. For a second, the rest of the guys stayed frozen. Their eyes went from Daly to me to Daly. Then one of the guys on my team ran in, and then another and another. The players on Daly's team picked up their gloves and hustled out to their positions in the field. Daly was stunned. When he finally understood the game was going on, as if he weren't there, he charged in and grabbed a bat from the on-deck circle. His eyes were on fire. I thought he was going to beat my brains out, but after what seemed like forever, he turned and hurled the bat into left field. This is a stupid game, he bellowed. He raced out to the pitcher's mound, yanked the ball out of the pitcher's hand, and threw it as far as he could. Then he stormed off the field. He never showed up again. After that, I was the leader on the diamond. I did, things, I did the things Jimmy had done. If the teams were unfair, I moved a guy or two to even them. If there was a close play, I made the call. One day I was late, and when I got to the park, the game hadn't started. We were waiting for you, Seth, Noah Alstrom said. We knew you'd be coming. Every single night, I'd rub saddle soap into my glove before I went to sleep. Then I'd smack a ball into the pocket over and over while I dreamed about being a major league ball player. Finally, I'd stick the ball into the pocket and tie a rope tight around the glove. As I, stu as I stuck it up on the shelf in my closet, I used to think that Jimmy was probably doing the same thing at the same moment, and I wondered if he ever thought of me. Chapter 2. At school, I changed too. Up until 8th grade, I was basically a C student, but the first quarter that year, I had all A's and B's. This is wonderful, my mother said when she saw my report card. Why didn't you tell me you were doing so well? That sounds stupid, but I didn't tell her because I didn't realize. I had been. I had been. That report card was a shock to me, too, and on the next report card, my grades were even higher. Back then, I dreamed up all sorts of crazy explanations. One thing it's for, sh for sure is I didn't think my good grades had anything to do with Jimmy, but I do now. Jimmy taught me to co concentrate. He was on baseball. 
on ground balls and, and line drives, on fastballs and curveballs, on knowing when to go for a double play and when to take the sure out at first. But it was concentration. And that's what school takes. I didn't study any harder, stay alive. That's what Jimmy said on the diamond. I stayed alive in the classroom. My favorite subject was English, <laughs> clearly. Um, mainly because Mrs. No one? Travis didn't make us read Newberry Metal books like my other teachers all had. All we had to do was turn in one book report every month. I read nothing but baseball books. I started out <clears throat> with a book on Honus Wagner. And then I read one about Dr. Jackie Robinson. After that, they went by like a blur. I know I read about Mays, Mangle, Roots, Cobb, Geary, Williams, Musial, all the greats. Those books were real eye-openers. Coaches make it seem like all great players are hardworking and dedicated, but that's not true. Some of the best baseball players, like Ruth and Mantle, drank and smoked and stayed up all hours of the night, but they still were great. Lots of players in the minors work real hard, real hard, but never amount to anything. The truth is that some guys can hit a curveball and some guys can't. Some guys can run down fly balls and some guys can't. Some guys, guys can drive a 90 mile an hour fastball out of the park and some guys can't touch it, not in a million years, no matter how much they practice. To be great, you've got to have it. You, can't, you can screw up and waste it. But if you don't have it in the first place, there's nothing you can do to get it. Nothing. Chapter 3. I hadn't forgotten Jimmy, but I'd given up on him, given up on given up on him like you give up on twisting, a twisting foul ball down the line that you know you can, can never reach no matter how hard you run. Jimmy lived in Belmont. I lived in Redwood City, eight miles, but he might as well have lived on the moon. Then, right before Babe Ruth was ready to start up again, a, f a phone call. I got a phone call. This is Jimmy Winter, he said. Remember me? For a moment, I was speechless. I absolutely couldn't make a word come out of my mouth. Seth, are you there? Yeah, Jimmy, I said finally. I'm here. Listen, how would you like to play on the Belmont Braves this year? My head was spinning. I was so excited to hear his voice. I could barely follow what he was saying. Who wouldn't? I finally stammered. Here's all you have to do. Come to Belmont High Saturday and pick up a registration form, but instead of putting your address down, put down your grandparents' address. Have your mother sign it and mail it in. I tried to think. The whole conversation was so fast, so unexpected. Won't someone notice we don't live in, don't have the same last name? He snickered at that. Nobody checks. Half the guys on the team don't live in Belmont. <gasps> really? I'm not kidding. After I hung up, I headed straight into the living room and told my mother about Jimmy's plan. When I finished, she looked at me quizzically. Run that by me again, she said. I went through it more slowly. As I spoke, her face soured. Wouldn't you call that cheating, she asked. Not exactly. Well, what would you call it? It's just bending the rules. She took a deep breath. Seth, let me tell you a story about your father. The first week we moved into this house, Mr. Mongolin invited him to play golf. He said he had a good time, but when Mr. Mongolin wanted to play again, your father wouldn't go. I asked him why. It turned out your father had seen Mr. Mongolin kick his golf ball out from behind a tree. No big deal, really. Just kind of bending the rules, but it was enough to keep your father from ever playing with him. Oh, Mom, I said, this is diff. diff. She cut me off. Is it, Seth? When I called Jimmy back, he got angry. Did you tell your mother lots of guys do this? Yeah, sure, I told her everything. Look, it's hopeless. I know my mother. She won't give in. There was a long pause. Your mother is a total bitch, Jimmy finally said. I flushed all over, then went icy cold. I know I should have made it, take it back, but I didn't. I talked to him a few more minutes before hanging up. That phone call happened more than three years ago. Some things you try to remember, and the harder you try, the more impossible it becomes. And then there are things you want to forget, like that phone call, and they never go away. Chapter 4. Just before Babe Ruth's season began, a counselor from Woodside High came to St. Pius. Most of the kids at St. Pius were going to Catholic high schools, but there were about 10 others besides me who went to the music room to register. Once we were all seated, the counselor stood. Woodside is a fine high school, he said, one of the best in the country, and we are hoping we are, we are expecting that each one of you, uh, through your talent and hard work, will make it even better. These next four years might just be the best years of your life. Make the most of them. We had already filled out the basic forms, name, address, phone number, that kind of stuff, a week earlier. This meeting was to nail down our schedules. The counselor went into the back office and called us to him one by one. I'll never forget sitting in the music room trying to make myself believe that I was actually going to be in high school for, in four months. I was sick of St. Pius, sick of being treated as if I were still a little kid, but I wasn't sure if I was ready for Woodside either. I was afraid it would be too hard, that I wouldn't be able to cut it. My turn finally came. The counselor had me sit on a metal folding chair. He looked at my transcript and, and then smiled broadly. This is going to be easy. You've put together a fine academic record, Seth, a fine academic record. Your grades are so good, in fact, that you qualify for our honors program. That covers the core subjects, English, math, 
history and science. He paused. PE is required by the state, so all I need to know is what foreign language you want to take. And then we're done. I was stunned. An honors program? I didn't belong in any honors pro program. He must have seen the fear in my eyes. Don't you want to be in the program, he, he asked. I shook my head. Those classes are too hard. I'm no brain. The kids in there are all going to be smarter than I am. I'll flunk. He leaned back in his chair. I don't see why you feel that way, Seth. You've done well in, at St. Pius. You'll do well at Woodside, and in four years, you'll go off to Cal Berkeley or UCLA, and you'll do fine there, too. I remembered a clip I'd seen about UCLA on ESPN at halftime of a basketball game. The lecture halls were like huge movie theaters. The library had millions of books, and the students were so serious. Their hands were flying across the keyboards of laptop computers or filling out yellow notepads on, with tiny writing. I couldn't picture myself studying late, studying Shakespeare or about the atmosphere of Saturn. I didn't want anything to do with an, any honors program. I felt as if I were drowning. I don't want to go to UCLA or any school like that, I managed at last. I'm not sure I want to go to college at all. Couldn't I take easier classes like business math or something? I don't have to be in the honors program, do I? He breathed in, then exhaled loudly. No, Seth, you don't have to be in the honors program, he shook his head. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make out two schedules, one honor, one a little softer. You go home, talk it over with your mother, see what she says. Tomorrow morning, sign one of the schedules and drop it in the mail, okay? I nodded, okay. I put off talking to my mother until I was almost ready to go to sleep. I guess I expected her to tell me to take the honors classes, but I was all set for a big argument. But she threw the decision right back at me. I want you to take the harder classes, Seth, she said. I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but you're not a little boy. You're the one who's going to have to do the studying. You've got to make up your own mind. I've made up my mind, I said. I want to take the easier classes. She nodded. Sleep on it. If you feel the same way in the morning, I'll mail the schedule to my, or on my way to work. I took a shower and hit the sack. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up sweating like a pig. I stumbled to the bathroom and sucked down some water. As I drank, I looked at myself in the mirror. That's when I knew I couldn't take the soft schedule. It wasn't that I cared that much about going to a big-time college or being in the honors program. I was afraid that if I backed off on the schoolwork, I might start backing off on hard ground balls. I might start stepping in the bucket on inside fastballs. I was afraid if I didn't go all out, all out in everything, I wouldn't go all out in anything. I'd go back to being the kind of guy I was before I met Jimmy, and I didn't want that. I didn't want that at all. Chapter 5, last page here. That season with the Redwood City Reds was tough. I wanted to make myself a better player, but there was nobody to talk to for advice. Take bunting. I read in books that you had to get the bat head, head out front, but I didn't know what that meant. When I asked Coach Loeffler, he stuck me in the batting cage and had me bunt ten times. He'd yell, good bunt, if, it, if the ball was fair, or you can do better if the ball dribbled foul. That was his idea of teaching. Eventually, I figured out that getting the bat out in front means you've got to get your bat into fair territory and bunt the ball before it reaches home plate. But figuring things out like that on my own made for slow going. It didn't help that our team was full of holes. We didn't have any speed, and without Jimmy, we didn't have any power, or a power RBI guy. Our first baseman had hands of stone, and our center fielder shied away from line drives. As the losses piled up, I'd whine at home about what a terrible coach Loeffler was. I suppose I was trying to make my mother feel bad about not letting me play on, Be on the Belmont Braves, though I don't know why. A couple of days after Jimmy's phone call, I'd seen Mr. Mongolin at Safeway. The second I saw him, I found myself thinking that he was a cheater, and I knew right then and there that I didn't want anybody to look at me and think, he is a cheater. One game on our schedule was special, the game against the Belmont Braves. When it was a month away, I was looking forward to, to it the way you look forward to your birthday. When it was two weeks off, I felt a kind of nervousness creeping over me. The final week before the game, I was almost sick. Getting to see Jimmy again was a big deal for me, but what if it was no big deal for him? What if he saw me and nodded and that was that? I didn't have any real friends on the Redwood City Reds, but that didn't mean Jimmy hadn't made new friends. Through him, I'd learned everything I knew about baseball, but I hadn't taught him anything. The day of the game, I headed over to the park two hours early. I thought I'd be the first guy there, but Jimmy was already hitting balls off a tee into the batting cage. I stood off and watched him for five minutes or so. His swing was sweet. I'd forgotten how sweet. But there was a crazy fury in him, too. That craziness had always been there, I guess. Only now, it was right there, right out in front instead of hiding. I kept thinking he'd see me, but he never did. He ripped ball after ball into the batting cage, retrieved them, smacked them again. It was like he was trying to batter the ball into oblivion. Hey, Jimmy, I finally called out. What's up? He jumped a little, but when he saw, me, it was, it, it, when he saw it was me, his face relaxed. Seth, I was hoping you'd show up early. How's it going? Okay, how about with you? He nodded. Okay, you want to play a little catch? I played catch a million times, but that, was, that time was special. It was just him and me and a little wind and, a, and the wet grass. 
As we tossed the ball back and forth, neither of us said a word, but it was like getting to know him again. The way he turned his shoulder in before he threw, the little flip of the glove he gave as he caught the ball, things like that were better than a lot of talk. Pretty soon other guys started showing up. I tried tuning them out and I think Jimmy did too. Finally his coach blew a whistle. Belmont Braves over here. There was no tuning that out. I threw the ball to Jimmy one final time. Good luck, I said. He laughed. You're going to need the luck. He Then he pulled a little grass out of the ground and tossed it in the air. Watch out on the pop-up set. The wind is swirling today. I nodded before heading to my teammates. We started hot. A walk, an error, another walk to me, and a long double brought across three runs in the first. Our pitcher held Belmont scoreless for the first two innings, even though Jimmy dro drove a triple to the base of the fence in his first at-bat. Heading to third, I thought we might pull up, pull off the upset, but the baseball, but baseball can drive you crazy. A bloop hit, that's what did it, did us in. A little broken bat job that plopped onto the grass in left field, barely two feet out from our third baseman's reach. That bloop hit came with two out in the third, and after that came everything. The Braves whistled bases, base hits all over the park, line shots down the right field line, long fly balls into the power alleys. Grounders through the hole. With five runs in, Jimmy unloaded a three-run homer to left. Belmont scored four more in the fourth, three in the fifth. It was a laughter for them. It was, yeah, a laugher for them. For us, it was torture. The innings crawled by. Jimmy was amazing, though. With his team way ahead, you'd think he'd let up a little, but he didn't. In the field, he kept his glove down in the dirt, his eyes on the batter, anticipating, always anticipating. The score was 15-4 in the sixth when Jimmy banged out his fourth hit, a one-out single to right. As he led off first, I looked at, over at him. I couldn't yell out, way to go, but I wanted to catch his eye to give him a nod that meant the same thing. That's why my head wasn't into the game, why I wasn't ready for the ground ball that came, a perfect two-hopper that should have resulted in an easy twin killing. I didn't charge the ball like I should have, and I double-clutched before I unloaded to Brad Coleman, who was a covering second. I've relived the next moment in a million times. I can still see Coleman pivot. I can still see Jimmy barreling in on him, and I can still see Coleman pinwheeling into the air. But most of all, I remember Coleman landing and the weird way his knee bent under him and the sound it made, a popping sound, I've never heard before or since. Coleman lay still, a glazed look on his face. Both coaches rushed out. Somebody called 911, Loeffler yelled. Within minutes, the medic one came. One of the men gently moved Coleman's lower leg. Doesn't that, or does that hurt, he asked. No, Coleman said, his face white. I don't feel anything. As they lifted him onto the stretcher, his lower leg flopped like a strand of cooked spaghetti. Jimmy was standing off by himself. I worked my way over to him. Don't feel bad. It wasn't your fault. He wheeled on me, and I felt those eyes again. It was his own fault. He should have been off the bag. The air raid, or the air raid, the air car, I'm sorry, aid car, roared off, siren wailing. The game was called. As I packed up my equipment bag, the guys on my team were cursing Jimmy, talking about what a dirty player he was. I didn't say anything to them, but I knew it wasn't that simple. Coaches say you're supposed to give it your all every minute of every game, and that's what Jimmy did, and it's stupid, and coaches shouldn't say it. With the score the way it was, Jimmy should have peeled off toward center field or slid so that his foot re just reached the bag. If he'd done either of those things, Coleman wouldn't have spent that summer on crutches. But Jimmy wasn't the only one to blame. I should have been on my toes playing the game, it, not back on my heels being a cheerleader for Jimmy. If I'd charged that ball and gotten my throw off cleanly, nothing would have happened. And it wasn't Coleman's, it was Coleman's fault too. We weren't little kids playing our first game. The second I double clutched on the throw, Coleman should have known he didn't have a prayer to turn a, a double play. He should have stepped on the bag and gotten off as fast as he could. The throw to first did him in, and that throw was, a bad, was bad baseball. I visited Coleman in the hospital. He was down in the dumps. His knee was going to need an operation. He didn't know when he was going to get out or how much physical therapy he was gonna have to do. I hung around for a half an hour or so listening and not saying much before heading for the door. Only one other guy has ever visited me, Coleman said before I made it. Who was that, I asked. The guy who nailed me? Jimmy Winter, I replied, amazed. Yeah, that's the guy. You know him? Yeah, I know him. What'd he say? Coleman frowned. Not much. He said he was sorry, but then he told me I shouldn't have been on the bag. He, he wasn't here two minutes. I stared at Coleman lying there in that big white bed. He didn't understand how hard it must have been for Jimmy to do what he'd done, and he wasn't in the mood to listen to me explain it, explain it to him. I guess if my leg looked like his, I wouldn't have wanted to hear it either. Hey, you'll, you'll come again, won't you? Coleman yelled out as I stepped into the hallway. Sure, I'll come again. You can count on it. I, can, I meant to keep that promise. I planned to go back to the hospital or visit Coleman at home, but I never made it. I've played a lot of baseball since then, in leagues and in pickup games at parks, and in all that time, I've never seen Coleman play. 
I'd like to think that he moved away or something. I hate to think that he can't play, that his leg never got back to normal. Chapter 7. The first couple of weeks at Woodside High School were, were tough. I had trouble beating the tardy bell, trouble remembering what books to bring, trouble opening my locker. Even gym class was a pain. <laughs> I never had enough time to shower, and some clown kept stealing my towel. But once I got a couple of tests under my belt, and once I could get my locker open on the first try, Woodside didn't seem so impossible. The honors classes were hard, and I had some more homework, but I did my assignments, and my grades didn't drop any. One week followed the next. The whole time I had my eye on spring and the beginning of baseball season. As baseball season grew closer, the word got out that there would be a new coach of the freshman baseball team. One kid whose mom worked in the office said it was going to be a man who didn't even teach at Woodside. Dad had some guys upset. I wish they'd let us play varsity, Todd. Or Todd Franks, the best athlete in my gym class, said, I hate the idea of wasting a year with some nobody. I was jittery the day of baseball sign-ups. We were supposed to meet in the cafeteria at 3.15. It wasn't even 3 o'clock when I got there, and Franks was the only other person in the room. At 3.20, I counted 16 guys total. I realized making the team would be no problem, and some of my nervousness went away. At 3.30, the door opened. In walked the school secretary, Mrs. Hawley. She passed out registration and insurance forms, gave us our practice and game schedules, that kind of stuff. I shoved the papers into my book bag. Your coach foamed, she said as she headed for the door. He'll, he says he'll be here soon and to wait if he can. Who is he? Somebody called to her. She shrugged. A new guy. I can't remember his name. We sat ten minutes before the door burst open and a tall, burly man with a short red beard charged in. He was young, probably not even thirty. My name is Rick Charant, he said before the door closed behind him. He talked so fast I couldn't follow. I know he said something about baseball being the only game that has a life of its own, whatever that means. And he said that every baseball, and I think he meant the ball itself, had a soul and that no football had a soul and no soccer ball or basketball or ping pong ball had one either. The whole time he spoke, his arms were waving and he paced back and forth like a big dog stuck in a small cage. He stopped as suddenly as he started. Our first practice is Tuesday. See you there. He was gone. What a geek, somebody in the back blurted out, bringing laughter from around the, around the room. I'll give him a break, another kid answered. I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd heard the name Rick Charant before. I felt like I'd seen him, too, when he was younger, without the beard, but I couldn't figure out where. As I did my homework that night, I kept trying to place him. I, I was reading about the Roaring Twenties when it came to me. I opened my desk drawer and pulled out the baseball cards Jimmy had given me. There he was, Ricky Charant, Cleveland Indians. I, I don't know. I flipped his card over, four years in the minors, then 18 games with the Indians, all at third base. 38 at-bats, nine hits, three RBIs, three runs scored, one double, no triples, one home run. I stared at the card for a long time. So what if he was strange? I thought the man had hit a ball out of the park in the major leagues. Millions of guys play baseball. Not many ever do that. In the locker room before our first practice, I told my teammates, he's too weird to have been in the majors, Todd Frank said. It must, have been, it must be some other Rick Charant. I, I, ask him, I answered. He'll tell you. You ask him, Frank's returned. Before practice started, Charant had us sit down on the infield grass facing him. Boys. He said, arms waving again. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing better you can do with your time than to play baseball. So I'm not much on picky rules. I don't care what clothes you wear, how long your hair is, whether you pierce your ears or pluck your eyebrows. I want you here, on the baseball diamond, not out drinking or getting your girlfriend pregnant. But that doesn't mean I don't have rules. In baseball, you get three strikes before you're out, and that's how I run my program. I'm not going to try to run down everything that could be counted against you. You know what I mean. Big stuff, failing classes, alcohol, drugs, theft. The first time you're suspended a game, a, a game, excuse me. The second time, two games. But if there's a third time, and I hope to God this never comes up, but if there's a third time that I'm going to have to have to figure you've had, you're the bad apple, and I'm going to heave you out of the barrel. He paused. I've had my say. Any of you have anything you want cleared up? A couple of guys looked over at me. Ask him. One of them whispered. I raised my hand. Did you play for the Cleveland Indians? I figured he'd be happy. Somebody knew that he'd puff and uh, puff and brag a little. But it was the opposite. His body sagged like he'd been punched in the stomach. Yeah, I played, he said. He tugged at his beard for a second. Do you know what it means when they say a player has a cup of coffee in the majors? He was looking straight at me. It means a guy makes the majors but doesn't stick. Well, I had a sip of a cup of coffee. Everything that went quiet, or everything went quiet for a minute. Charant blew his whistle. Okay, let's get started. After we stretched, Charant told us he wanted us to check our speed. I figured he'd have us run the 50-yard dash, but instead he put us at home plate, had us hit a ball, and then timed how long it would take us to make it to first base. Then he had us work on getting out of the box quicker. After we'd sweated out a couple of hours of drills, Charant called us to him. That was great. Super practice. We'll do a lot more of that. Fundamentals, that's the name of the game. Right now, you're young men who play baseball. I'm going to turn you into baseball players. He paused. 
Let's run two miles and call it a day. We thought he was joking. We'd done nothing but run for two hours, but Charant headed for the track. So we trudged behind him. He lined us up, blew his whistle, and we took off. A strange thing happened. Most coaches are real good at blowing their whistles and telling you to run while they scratch their fat bellies, but Charant didn't stand. He ran with us. Actually, he ran ahead of us. Junior Tupo kept up, up with him for the first mile, but at the finish, Sharon had beat him by 50 yards easy. I finished in the middle of the pack. My side ached. My face was bright red. My throat was filled with snotty spit. I leaned forward, gasping for air. Sharon patted me on the back. Nice run, kid. Nice run. He wasn't even winded. When I finally had the strength to look up, Todd Franks was crossing the finish line last by 200 yards. He'd barely broken a sweat. Was that your best effort? Sharon barked at him. I never was good at track, Franks replied coolly.